thank you all for coming. Um, the talk that I'm going to give today is going to be looking at um, the history of oysters in North Carolina and trying to understand the way that their value to the state may have changed. Um, probably nothing has changed specifically about the way oysters work, but the way that people perceive them and the, thing that, the things that people perceive as the values of oysters have certainly changed. So first off, I need to start with um, the title of my talk, A Short History of a Small Bivalve. When I, sh I shared this with uh, my lab at IMS, I was immediately hit with questions about how small do I really think oysters are? They're not that small. But as some of you may know, it is an homage to a 1980s book, A Short History of a Small Place by T.R. Pearson, which is a great story that is about Reedsville, North Carolina and explaining the ebbs and flows of the power of, of different families and the ebbs and flows of the fate of the city. And I thought it was a nice link to the things that I'm gonna be talking about today. So what are we gonna try to do today? This is a picture of me on the first day that I went out to a set of oyster reefs in a place called Middlemarsh, very near the Institute of Marine Sciences. And those of you who know me well know that it must have been a very cold day because I'm wearing waders and a winter coat. Um, though not gloves, so it was probably only about 15C. Um, so it was an extremely cold, excuse me, 15F, not 15C. It was an extremely cold day, but it was a great day to begin to understand, for me, um, what oyster reefs did in the context of things like nutrient cycling and understand their role in regulating the, next troph the lower trophic levels of primary producers. And so what I'm going to do today is take you through a series, um, first a, a background on oysters in North Carolina, a bit of history about how um, oysters have played in, in political realms and the role that they've played in different times in our state's history, and then walk you through a series of papers from my lab that are a really good example of how we like to do things. We go into natural systems and try and understand how they work and take that understanding and try to apply it to solving problems. So I'm gonna cover a lot of ground in terms of, of papers today, not in a lot of detail. So if you look in the chat section, there's a Word file that I uploaded there that's got the references for the papers that I'm gonna talk about today in case anyone is interested in, in deeper technical information on it. So that's gonna be the roadmap. We'll start with a little bit of history. We'll walk through the beginning of oyster research in my lab and then end up bookending it with a project that we're just getting started right now. So Jonathan Swift said it best. He was a bold man that first ate an oyster. Uh, if you take a look at that, no matter how much you love oysters, maybe that doesn't look like something that if you had never eaten it before, you would say, that looks like something I'm gonna eat. But at some point it happened. Um, people, um, culturally, oysters are incredibly important uh, throughout the world. And people very quickly uh, became very good at acquiring them first by hand, then using some rudimentary tools, and then eventually through trawling. And like so many things that people do, um, we got really good at it. And unfortunately, we got so good at it that the resource um, did not sustain itself as fishing persisted. So there's a great paper by Kirby in 2004 called Fishing Down the Coast. And the dates on this figure throughout the Gulf and Atlantic coast of the United States reflect the dates that oysters became functionally extinct in certain bays. And the interesting thing is that the dates are directly correlated to their distance from Manhattan. So you'll see that the farther away you were from New York City, um, the farther, the longer it took um, for the resource to become extinct. And this was a reflection of the fishing efforts coming out of primarily Chesapeake Bay, um, expanding out into areas as, as the resources were depleted closer to home. And so on the right-hand side, we have total landings um, through time. And what you see is, is a peak um, in the late 1800s. And in, actually in North Carolina, the peak was right around 1902. And then, um, yeah, so forgive me, these dates are the peak harvest as opposed to the functional extinction. So the peak harvest corresponds to the distance from New York. And what we see is that if you look at the, the through time snapshot on the right-hand side, is that that peak harvest was never repeated. And so uh, oysters were fished down to the extent that they did not recover. So this has been a challenge that has been for decades, something that people are addressing and trying to use lots of different methods to get oysters back both onto people's plates and to get oysters back into the environment for the things that I'll talk about in just a second. <laughs> 
So in North Carolina, um, there's a noted figure in the past, a guy named Francis Winslow, who in the late 1800s uh, mapped the North Carolina oyster resource. That's in the upper right-hand corner there. And these maps are, are noted for their accuracy and people who do oyster research use them as references um, for citing uh, work today and find that the, the measurements and the locations of all these historic reefs were incredibly accurate, um, particularly given that time. So Winslow provided us that great asset. Um, the interesting thing about Winslow is that after he provided this report to North Carolina about the state of the resource, um, the oyster resource in North Carolina, he quickly turned around and began working for an oyster company. So probably not a coincidence, he knew where all the good oysters were and quickly opened up a company at, or uh, became the manager of a company and then uh, started activities to extract oysters. So the oyster wars, when you hear people talk about oyster wars, they're mostly talking about um, the Chesapeake where there were noted oyster pirates, um, where there was lots of armed conflict, loss of life, just kind of crazy when you think about it. Um, but there were oyster wars in North Carolina and they were, um, the flashpoint was Winslow and people who he brought in to fish, um, extracting oysters from around the Outer Banks and coming into conflict um, with folks in areas that um, did not want to have outsiders fishing there. So Ocracoke, um, which is in Hyde County, was a noted point of conflict. Um, Winslow took out an order against locals who were not letting his, his oyster fishers fish and asked the sheriff to take action. And the sheriff was unable to because there was local armed resistance. And so the Ocracokers fought off the, the oystermen from the outside. But not for long, um, the oystering very quickly picked up and outside, uh, outside fisher people from the Chesapeake Bay and areas where they had uh, advanced equipment for the time quickly came into the state and as we saw in the last map and, and I indicated, um, the peak harvest was early in 1900 and, and was never restored. So this is the story of people's affection for oysters and people's um, really gro quickly growing um, capacity to extract them. And that's something that repeats itself obviously in lots of things related to the environment where we get really good at doing something and it goes to the point where the extraction is problematic. And with oysters, people have referred to them as, as their extraction is looking more like a mining curve rather than a fisheries curve. So the really interesting thing to me about North Carolina is that, and, and many places really, is that oysters have become, rather than a political flashpoint and a flashpoint for, for disagreements, even armed disagreements, there's something that are, are really broadly supported um, there's really bipartisan support for oyster restoration, for oyster culture, for supporting the oyster industry. Um, and this is really true in North Carolina and really true throughout the country at a time where bipartisan issues are, are not that common. So I think that that is an interesting change that has definitely occurred through history. Rather than being a negative thing, um, oysters now are something that tend to bring people together. So why is that? Um, part of it stems from our more recent understanding of all the great things that oysters do for people. So on the left-hand side on the top there um, is what's called the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. And it was a synthesis that brought forward, not for the first time, people had talked about ecosystem services, which are the value of natural systems to people um, prior to this, but the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment really brought it into prominence and really brought forward this concept of natural systems as providing economic value for people. And that's, that's a critical connection if you're talking about ecosystem services. Great things that happen in an ecosystem for the ecosystem are not ecosystem services. They only are if they provide value to people. And for people who do work like I do, um, focused on fairly esoteric things like nitrogen cycling, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment was a beautiful thing. Um, it, pre it presented us with an opportunity to frame our work in a way that was much more broadly appreciated. So we could talk about a salt marsh providing $1,000 per acre per year in, in service through assessment of an ecosystem service. Um, 
and compare that and contrast that with what would happen to the, the different fates of a salt marsh if, if it were lost to development or if it were restored. So this connection of economics to economic values to nature was really a great thing for us because our work, frankly, is, is a little less charismatic, a little harder to get people excited and engaged in than a really charismatic animal or something like that. So for us, it was great. And we, there's a hesitancy, of course, you don't want to try to, you don't want to suggest that nature can be valued um, just as a dollar value, but this did allow decisions to be made in a common framework and to have a comparison and a sense of the, the values of the loss and the gain of natural systems. So on the bottom part of this figure um, is a table from John Grabowski's paper in 2012, which is on that list that I, that I put in the notes or that I put in the chat. Um, and this is looking at ecosystem services of oysters. And so this was a, in 2012, this is a brand new thing. And so the various things that oysters might do, improving water quality, stabilizing shorelines, perhaps burying carbon. Um, that's a paper I didn't put on the list. A great paper by Joel Faudry looks at that issue which is a pretty nuanced because building shell actually generates CO2, but I won't go into that, but I, I urge you to look that up. Um, habitat provisioning. Oysters are long known as a great home for, for other organisms. And diversifying the landscape. So uh, a, a landscape that has heterogeneity to it is necessarily more functional. And then finally, and importantly, and this is a different thing for me and my group is one of the ecosystem services of oysters is the oysters as food. So that presents for us a different kind of balance. We've never worked in a system where people want to eat it before. So this is a different kind of consideration when you're thinking about decisions being made about oysters. And for example, restoration for production versus restoration for ecosystem function. So the real benefit of this ecosystem uh, services framework for me was that it allowed you to take a holistic look at services like these and think about actions that are going on, whether they be loss of habitat, gain of habitat, um, alternate applications of the same organism, like culturing of oysters, which I'll talk about at the end, and weigh the costs and benefits in a, a really organized way. So there's a paper that came out in 2012 that was called The Eutrophication Commandments. And it is a really good paper. It is a, a funny and interesting look at whether or not, how we can uh, combat eutrophication. So eutrophication is excessive uh, carbon loading to a system. Most often it's through algal growth. And this paper suggested that um, it, it was in the post ecosystem service era, era and it suggested that habitats in coastal systems um, are valuable because they provide this filtering capacity. And it cited the first paper of ours, um, Peeler and Smith 2011, which was the first to measure rates of nitrogen removal on oyster reefs. And I'll talk more about that in a second. But this idea that water quality, sustaining water quality could be quantitatively linked to things like habitat um, wasn't brand new but the degree to which you could do it in, in a quantitative and more robust fashion was definitely enhanced as the ecosystem service model moved forward. So for a long time, I worked at Coastal Studies Institute and one of my colleagues, Robert McClendon, is a very funny guy. And whenever I would talk to him about going somewhere to give a talk, he would say, please tell me you're not gonna talk about nitrogen. But as always, I probably was going to talk about nitrogen. And this is just a very brief overview of the nitrogen cycle. And this is a, a figure that I like that's not really up to date. It doesn't pre uh, present all of the nitrogen processing routes. But I like it because it gives the, the visual appearance of being balanced, which at one time the nitrogen cycle was a lot closer to balance than it is today. So if you look on the left-hand side, there's a process I'm going to talk a little more about called denitrification, which is the removal of nitrate, the bioavailable nitrogen that um, things like algae, when, it's, when there's too much of it, will use to, to bloom. And then on the right-hand side, you have nitrogen fixation. And there are lots of forms of natural nitrogen fixation. Um, there are a whole suite of organisms who can fix nitrogen. Lightning fixes nitrogen. And at one point, that supply of nitrogen fixation and denitrification we're much more balanced than they are today. 
And I think most of you know that what led to a lot of this imbalance was following World War II, the commercialization of the Haber-Bosch process allowed us to fix, use an industrial process to fix nitrogen from the air, which is 70 some percent of, of the atmosphere. So a, a very, very huge supply of nitrogen available then to become fixed. So this is how we make fertilizer. This is how we do lots of things that require fixed nitrogen in excess of the amount that it's, it's generally available in the environment. So this, um, this has been a challenge for the environment for certain, but it also was done in response to a growing global population and the need to feed a global population that was growing quickly. So if you look at the figure on the upper right-hand side, um, you see that as we had more people, we got more fixed nitrogen. Um, this was not coincidental, and this was a part of the, the revolution in our ability to, to commercially grow food. Um, it, however, wasn't done and isn't necessarily by nature efficient, and so what it's resulted in is a huge amount of additional reactive nitrogen in the environment. So we've got more reactive nitrogen for better or for worse um, on the right-hand side. And then on the left-hand side is a figure from uh, Lena Zoom or er Ermgassen's paper from 2013, looking at historic oyster filtration. So not just historic oyster populations, but the filtration capacity. So there's in Chesapeake Bay, there are lots of discussions about loss of filtration capacity that the bay used to get filtered one time every day. And now it's, one time, a much longer period of time, maybe every year or some number of months. But what this is showing is throughout the United States, individual bays, loss of filtration capacity. So oysters, when we looked at the table of ecosystem services, the way that they enhance water quality relies on their filtration capacity to maximize that removal. And so looking through all of these bays, with the exception of Apalachicola, which I should really take off because it's an aberration in the data, but I left it in there just because that that's part of the paper as well. It was, a, it was a historic analysis, and the time that the historic analysis was done led you to believe that there were more oysters in Apalachicola Bay, than, or more filtration capacity now than there was before, which is really not the case. But if you look almost across the board, there is nearly, you know, at least 50% loss in filtration, and in many, very close to 100% loss in filtration. So this is a dramatic change in how these natural systems are working. And what oysters do, they do a number of things, but the main thing they do from, from our perspective and the research that we do, is they couple the water column to the sediments. So they draw things out of the water and transport them to the sediments where processes go on that change them, among them, chiefly among them, the process denitrification that I talked about in the outset. So we were really interested um, we actually, we had funding from NOAA to look at sea level rise and how habitats would change as sea level rose. And North Carolina is a wonderful place in that it has lots of intact habitats. It has diverse areas um, with lots of habitats in close proximity. And so this was a great opportunity. And this is actually where we started our work on oyster reefs. And it wasn't anything visionary. We were out and saw oyster reefs adjacent to salt marshes and seagrass beds and we're taking cores to run the flux experiments that we do and just decided that, hey, what, let's see what's happening in the oyster reefs and look and see what's in the literature when we finish it up. And when we looked, there wasn't anything. So we were able to, to publish that first paper um, that I'll talk about in just a second. But here, we're going to take a brief detour and have a contest. So North Carolina is shown here. Um, you see we have that wonderful coastline and the beaches. And you also see that we have the estuarine shoreline, the interior shoreline. So using the chat function, I would like everyone who would like to participate to provide two numbers. First, the miles of coastal shoreline, then the miles of estuarine shoreline. And we're gonna give you about 15 seconds so that people can answer without hopefully using their phones. But if you choose to cheat, that's on you. And the winner will receive these amazing Carolina blue oyster socks and they will be delivered by Emily or me at some point safely, adhering to all of the standards of safe mailing. So let's take a few seconds. Everybody go ahead and submit an answer if you'd like to. There'll be no judgment about wrong answers.
Um, it is, it, it's a remarkable What was it thing. again? Will you repeat the questions? The question is the miles of shoreline, of ocean shoreline, and then comma, the miles of estuarine shoreline in North Carolina. All right, so right, we'll- I'm kind of thinking. I mean, you gotta kind of think, right? Even though you're not looking it up, I swear. All right, well, you can keep thinking and it'll be the first person to answer correctly or <laughs> the person who is closest after about a minute or so. And we're not gonna, we won't go through the answers right now. We'll, we'll circle back to it at the end. But keep in mind, the stakes are high because these are near perfect socks. On brand color. I'm sorry if some of you come from other places where it might feel like it's burning your legs. But uh, this, these, are, these are the thing. So I'm going to move forward. Feel free to continue answering. Um, so we move into to North Carolina's habitats. And it's a wonderful opportunity because North Carolina is a place where you don't have to imagine what a marsh looked like or seagrass beds or oyster or natural oyster reefs look like. They're still present. We have development for certain, and the natural system has, has felt some of that. But North Carolina has tremendous natural resources, which makes it a wonderful place to work. And makes the Institute for the Institute of Marine Sciences a great place to be a researcher, I can tell you firsthand. So this is a figure from our first, um, from Ashley Smith and my first paper, and I'll mention Ashley's name at the end in, in the acknowledgments, but she provided, she was a foundational part of all of these efforts, and the research that went on in my lab was very much um, a result of her great ideas, creativity, hard work, and, and a wonderful partnership that I really enjoyed for, for the years that she was with us. Um, this figure is um, on the list that I put on the chat. And I'll start off by saying that we had an argument over the color scheme and I won. So it's clear that I'm a fan of the child's room slash circus color scheme. But in the end, it, it ended up working well because this, this figure of denitrification um, in different habitats through different seasons was the first time that all these habitats had been measured together and the, the first time that oyster reefs had ever been measured. And what's notice, notable is that the rates of denitrification, this valuable removal process, were highest in oyster reefs. And so this was something that we began to build on. And in this paper, we, we talked about the idea of ecosystem function and ecosystem services and how considering these seasonal changes in all these habitats is important. Um, the flats, the subtidal flats and intertidal flats are important because they're a big part of the natural system, but they're also a big part of this paper because they allowed us to compare what would the intertidal area be like if it didn't have an oyster reef or if it didn't have a salt marsh. So they were good reference sites. Ashley then went on and published an additional paper um, a year or two later that looked at a similar area and made similar measurements, but did things like measure inundation to understand how long all these habitats are underwater, um, and then scaled it to the entire landscape. And this, you know, it's a little bit intuitive, but the highest rates don't have, always have the highest total nitrogen removal. The oyster reefs are, are not the highest, but that's because they have a pretty small area. So there's a lot of subtidal flat with a somewhat lower rate, but still a larger proportion of, of the whole nitrogen removal. And what we did um, because of the time that we were in was not only look at this change in nitrogen as a result of these habitats, but then tried to get to understanding the economics of, of the nitrogen removal. And it turned out it was, it was non-trivial and it really it changed the way that we conveyed the information that we generated. It wasn't just about part of ecosystem function, it was about the economics of the area where we were working. So Bogue Sound, which is in Carteret County, right next to the Institute of Marine Sciences, has pretty good water quality, even though it's, it is pretty fully developed. And we think a non-trivial part of this may be contributions from these habitats to removing nitrogen and sustaining water quality. We did some back of the envelope calculations based on this work and some other work that we had done in small coastal watersheds measuring the loading of nitrogen and figured out that about 76% of the total watershed nitrogen load to Bogue Sound was being denitrified by all of these habitats. So it was confirming what we suspected, that this, this was a big part in sustaining water quality in this area. So North Carolina's beautiful natural systems are great for tourism, are great for 
enjoying nature, but they also have significant value as things, um, as something like a water quality regulating tool. So this is the paper that I showed the, you the table from, John Grabowski's paper in 2012, looking at oyster ecosystem services, um, the fisheries, um, the fish production, the fisheries being actually fishing the oysters, fish production, shoreline stabilization, and water quality. These, these tend to be the big three that people think about, um, shoreline stabilization, fish, whether they be the oysters or the things that live there, and then water quality. Um, what was interesting for us, and this was some time ago, um, is that of the total value per hectare of the oyster ecosystem services, about 40% of it, um, based on these calculations, was nitrogen removal. So we were excited to have done the early work in this area and more excited still that it was a significant part of the total value uh, that oysters were providing to people. So then we decided that we needed to know more. If we were going to advocate restoration or we were going to ad advocate conservation, we knew that an oyster reef wasn't just an oyster reef. And so we benefited from some wonderful past work um, that John Grabowski, who is a student of Pete Peterson's at, at IMS, did in Middlemarsh, the area that I alluded to. And what John did was build um, significantly sized oyster reefs in different landscape contexts. So out on a flat by themselves, next to a, reef, next to a um, marsh, or between a marsh and a seagrass bed. And this is important because oysters occur in all of those different areas. So if you just look at an oyster on a mudflat or a sandflat, you're probably gonna get a different picture of, of how it works in terms of its contributions to nutrient cycling and thus its contributions to sustaining water quality. So this study um, has lots of, of great information in it and is definitely on the list that I, that I put in the chat. But the take home message was for denitrification that if you have oysters present, um, they're going to do a better job of removing nitrogen. So this figure, the purple bars, are um, the controls, which are the habitat without oysters, and then the darker purple is that same habitat with oysters. So on the left-hand side, you've got the far left-hand bars are just a mudflat, and then a mudflat with an oyster reef on it. The bars next to that, the brownie green color, um, are areas where we had the same habitats, but we pulsed in nitrate to simulate a storm or a delivery of, of nitrogen to the system. And so you see in all of them, the mudflat, the marsh, and the seagrass and marsh, all the different contexts, when you pulsed in nitrate, there was a big increase in denitrification, but only when the oysters were there. So something about the oysters was allowing the sediments to denitrify more quickly. And it was probably that oysters, the organic matter that oysters bring to the sediment is really labile, meaning that it's really available to the microbial community, and it was better able to fuel this process of denitrification. So if you're gonna talk about ecosystem services and talk about enhancing resilience, you need to have natural systems that respond when an event occurs. And so the beauty of this experiment, of Ashley's experiment here, is that she simulated that by having nitrate pulse in, which is what happens when you have a storm event and elevated nutrients. Another thing that Ashley was interested in was this idea of oysters as ecosystem engineers. So allergenic and autogenic engineering, it's just a distinction about whether or not it's the, the, the function of the structure. So is it the oysters filtering or is it just the structure of the structure, the oysters sticking up in the water column? And this is um, interesting from a, from a scientific and ecological standpoint, but also interesting from a functional standpoint is you wanna understand what is it about these constructed reef, reefs that is enhancing denitrification? Is it just the fact that there are structure in the water or is it the fact that they're filtering things out of the water? And you know, the answer is probably something of both, but a really neat experiment was conducted that um, allowed Ashley to see the rates of denitrification without oysters, so adjacent to the areas where we were conducting these experiments. Um, the rate with shell, just shell, so these were oyster pockets. Um, that had had the um, oysters removed, so it was the, the same orientation as uh, the other oysters. And then finally, treatments with live oysters. And what we found was that the shell provided some enhancement, but the live oysters provided further enhancement. 
And it was really interesting that this happened very quickly. This is a two week experiment. And so when you think about habitats and denitrification, salt marshes are a place where people have worked a lot for a long time. And in restored salt marshes, the dogma is that it takes decades for the capacity to denitrify to reach the level of natural systems. Um, we wouldn't assert that this experiment tells us all of the truth, but it at least tells us that in two weeks, the rate of denitrification was really similar to that which we see in, in natural reefs. So this was, was another interesting step forward in that arc that I was talking about where we try to understand natural systems and then we begin to ask questions that allow us to understand how the function of natural systems can be applied to solve problems. So in this case, it's trying to understand how quickly oyster restoration might be able to um, begin assisting with um, sustaining and improving water quality. So the final piece um, that I'll talk about in past work is, is thinking about living shorelines. On the top um, figure there, we have a, a coastal shore, I'm sorry, a living shoreline siting tool that is um, from the Nature Conservancy's resilience.org and is a great tool to think about um, homeowners and landowners shorelines and, and ways that they might be stabilized. So living shorelines are a concept that uh, began some time ago, primarily in the Chesapeake Bay, originally um, with big abiotic features like granite, um, and has evolved to having the hardened part of the shoreline uh, more often be things like oysters, and is, is an alternative for shoreline stabilization to things like bulkheads and riprap and, and other methods that people use to stabilize their shorelines. Um, like all natural systems that we've been talking about, um, ecosystem service concepts uh, should be applied to anything that you're, you're doing in a natural system and in a coastal system. The, the things that we're interested in, in terms of ecosystem services, are very much the same. Obviously, living shorelines primarily are regarded as a shoreline stabilization alternative. So the degree to which they, they stabilize sediments and, and sustain the position of shorelines is important. They also provide habitat. Um, they have long been attributed uh, with maintaining uh, water quality and removing nutrients. However, there hadn't been any measurements of this until 2018 um, when my former student Kathleen Onorevle published a great paper about um, denitrification in living shorelines. And what she did that was really interesting, and this goes back to this idea of how long does it take to develop the capacity to denitrify similar to a natural system, is she was able to locate living shorelines of various ages, um, from 20 years old to less than one year old and to measure the process of denitrification. In this case, um, the axis indicates N2 flux, but because it's a positive flux, this is all denitrification. And this is comparing um, both marsh and oyster reef denitrification in living shorelines. And the things that were interesting, really interesting for us, was that within six or seven years, um, the capacity to denitrify was, was quite high and as high as it got even at 20 years. And it was also interesting that these two habitats were really similar, indicating then when you have something like a living shoreline, there may be um, less of a distinction between specific habitat types. So if you start at the beginning of my talking about nitrogen cycling and bring yourself to here, what we did was understand how natural habitats work and then look for applications of that understanding to solve problems. And, and this is, is a great example, is that we now know that relatively quickly, living shorelines will be making contributions to sustaining water quality through removing excess nitrogen, and that it will happen um, in a similar manner in all the habitats. So this is really important information for efforts like these that all have an economic cost to undertake, and understanding the economic benefit is critical to both pitching and then sustaining activities like these. So finally, I will talk a little bit about oyster culture. Um, this is a quote from the North Carolina Strategic Plan for Shellfish Mariculture that um, Joel Faudry at IMS was the lead author on, and it's providing a vision for this industry out to 2030. And this is, I'm not going to read it, but it's strong empirical evidence. So it's, it, North Carolina has the potential to, a lot of people have talked about becoming the Napa Valley of oysters and that there have been recent investments and that 
the things I talked about, the, the habitat quality throughout the state provides an opportunity to grow a whole range of different oysters that could be very appealing to the industry. But along with this, um, oysters are gonna be in the environment in a way, um, in a number and in a way that they have not been historically. And so while people tend to think oysters um, positive for water quality, we don't have as much information about oyster culture. Um, Ashley Smith, who I mentioned before, who was such a great part of our lab, left and did a postdoc through the Smith Fellowship Program um, looking at oyster culture and, and gathered some really important um, foundational information on how culture may be different from natural systems. But there's still some applied questions that, that remain to be asked. And we're excited that recently um, we were funded to look at, and this is a funny story, I had this um, figure was in a proposal and I remembered that it was the best figure ever and then I looked at it last night and realized that it's not necessarily the best figure ever. However, it does tell a story. Um, what it's showing is the design for this new project that North Carolina just funded um, Joel Faudry, who's at IMS, and Jim Morley, who is now at Coastal Studies Institute at ECU, and I to conduct. And this is to look at denitrification in sediments in areas with oyster culture um, up and down the coast, the southern, central, and northern coast, in two positions in the estuary, near the inlet and farther upstream, and importantly with two gear types, so floating rack and bottom cages, which are beautifully illustrated here. Um, but you can see just by their position in the water column that they would likely have very different impacts on the sediments. And so this will be a great um, data set to be able to say substantive empirical things about how culture is affecting nutrient cycling in all of these places. There are lots of reasons to believe that position in estuary will be important. There are lots of reasons to believe that gear type will be important. And certainly geographic diversity tends to play a role. Unfortunately, oyster mediated denitrification does not seem to be something that can be easily generalized and, and translated across systems. So with that, um, I will just say that oysters in North Carolina are, are still a wonderful resource um, in the wild, which is, is rare. We still have places that can be wild areas that can be fished, which is not very common. Um, we have a growing um, oyster culture community, as I just outlined. We have a great past of, of oyster restoration. And all of these things, as I hope this quick overview um, has demonstrated, have connections to water quality. However, they're, they're different and they all require a little bit of a specific approach to be able to quantify it. And I think it's important to remember that an oyster is not just an oyster um, in the environment. It depends whether they're in intertidal, subtidal. I think I demonstrated that context matters. Um, and certainly things like natural systems and cultural sy cultured systems are going to behave differently. But it is, it, are, it is our hope that our work will continue on and build the way that we like to build it, which is start out by understanding the natural system and then work forward from there. With that, I have lots of people to acknowledge. This is the work of many. Um, I use some funny pictures of my old collaborators, um, David Kimbrough with the sunglasses sort of in the middle on the bottom, Jeb Byers with longer hair, um, Randall Hughes and John Grabowski, uh, who were pictured there when John was building the reefs. You may not get a sense, but John is a giant. And so I think that was part of what allowed this work to be done is just having someone who is physically capable of building these large reefs, which you can see one of them behind him. Um, upper left-hand corner, Ashley Smith and Suzanne Thompson. Ashley, who I've already noted her role. Suzanne, our lab manager, who is foundational in everything we do. Um, in the middle top is Ashley and Luke Dodd. And I didn't talk about Luke's work, but he did really interesting work on acidification and oysters. Um, Kathleen on her overlay in the bottom left hand side. And then since I was using goofy pictures, I found a goofy picture of me and it made me wish that I could get a haircut. But I will wait, hopefully that will be coming soon. With that, I will thank you all. I will acknowledge our funding sources. National Science Foundation gener generously supported this work through two grants. Um, North Carolina Sea Grant notably funded the very first work and funded the most recent work, so I'm grateful to them. And NOAA, as I mentioned, funded an original sea level rise project that provided some motivation for it. And I would be happy to answer questions in the way that Emily tells me would be best. Thank you all. I think we'll go ahead and um, since 
traditionally our bagel breakfasts are a discussion. Um, we'll try to make it a discussion, but if it gets to be too overwhelming, we will ask people to move to chat. So if you want, if you have a question, go ahead and unmute yourself and um, go ahead and ask Mike. I'm good, thanks. How are you? Good, great presentation. I have a question about the filtering role of oysters. So this was so interesting to really learn more about that capacity. But what does that mean for um, either seasonal or ongoing concerns about contamination of a food source? So Kathleen, I'm really sorry. You were a little quiet at the beginning and I missed the first part. I got the seasonal issues with contamination of a food source, but not the beginning. Just be, given that their role in filtration, I was wondering. Given their role in filtration, I was wondering whether there, I know there are some bacteriological issues, but with other contaminants, how much of a concern either seasonally or throughout the, their life cycle are contaminants for consumers of oysters? Yeah, so I think that that's definitely a concern. The seasonal patterns, you know, there's the old only eat oysters in our months, and that's related to a kind of general pattern of, of when path human pathogens are most likely to be present. Um, that, I think, has turned into not so much of a, a great set of guidance just because the, the farming of oysters and the, the harvest of oysters is so much more targeted that that seasonal um, pattern for pathogens is, is maybe there are places where it's a problem all the time and then there's a place there are places where it's a problem less of the time. For other contaminants, I can't think of seasonality, but certainly if you have um, known water quality challenges, they're almost certainly going to manifest themselves in oysters. So that would be as a food source for certain um, a consideration. I Seasonally, I can't think of one that is something other than pathogens. But I will also say, interestingly, from like an ecosystem function perspective, some of the most beautiful and intact oyster reefs that are doing wonderful things are down, wonderful things for the environment are downstream from sewage treatment plants because they're closed. And so there's that, that dichotomy of good for people to eat versus good for the environment, which has manifested itself in, in funny ways, sometimes with closed waters. So Mike, did you say that, um the same types of studies that you've been working on in these natural systems that they have not been conducted or just now starting to be conducted in um, oyster farming in our estuarine waters? So in our estuarine waters, there are, there are not the kinds of studies that we do. Um, Ashley, who is in our lab, did great work in, in Virginia. And there's been a lot of work done recently in the Northeast. Um, what could be the downsides, right? I mean, what, what could be, could, could there be a downside? Is there any way that it's not helpful to have more oysters in the water, regardless of kind of how they get there or what species they are? Yeah, so it could be a downside. So the, the idea that coupling the water column to the sediments is good for water quality is predicated on the sediments not already having excessive organic matter loads. Right. So if you're in areas where you have really organic rich sediments already, you can drive, rather than um, creating a system that moves particulate matter to the sediments and then it's denitrified, you can drive the system to a state where it will be, it won't be removing that nitrogen, it'll rather be releasing it. And so that can, it'll mostly be ammonium and that'll, that's a great way to fuel an algal bloom. So right. it, it depends on what the environmental conditions are. Do oysters even grow in those mucky organic? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, that's where stump sound oysters grow. The finest oysters in North Carolina. And I'll fight anybody that says otherwise. Mike, you're muted. <laughs> oh. 
got muted. Now I'm unmuted. I think uh, Brian had his, had his hands up. Yeah. Um, uh, thanks, Mike, for a, a really cool presentation. Um, so you may or may not know this about me, but I am a hobbyist aquaponics enthusiast. Nice. And um, yeah, the the nitrogen cycle is a really important part of this because basically the fish poop uh, turns into the nitrogen that, that the plants use to grow. And I'm certainly no expert on all this, but it's my understanding that there's sort of beneficial, there's kind of two different bacteria that um, first convert the uh, ammonia to, to I don't know, some other nitrite or nitrate. Right. And, then, and then there's another one that does the next step. Yeah. Um, and the way my understanding and my experience has been that those bacteria need to have uh, some sort of substrate um, that like I use gravel or these clay pellets and stuff. And, and there's like nooks and crannies. And it seems like the more nooks and crannies that the substrate has, the more bacteria get, get in the system and the better the system is able to um, deal with, with, the, with the ammonia. And so it, it sounds to me like something similar is happening here, even though we're, we're dealing with a, a, a brackish saltwater environment. Um, and, and then also that your results from the kind of uh, nitrogen services of just the shells um, it seems like they were doing something also. So it seems to me that um, if too much nitrogen is an issue and you can't get oysters to grow, um, that simply dumping in rock or you know something like that might have a beneficial effect. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Um, if you go way back to the first papers I ever published from my dissertation, I was interested in degrading oil spills with natural communities and to have the, the organisms present to both fix nitrogen and degrade oil, you had to have, to maximize it, you had to have substrate present. It's the exact thing you're referring to. Bacteria tend to thrive when they're attached. It allows them, because they're not free floating, they can grow faster. Um, the things that they that they're involved with in terms of eating or metabolizing or processing tend to come to surfaces. And so uh, that, uh, that's absolutely right. Um, their you know, gravel filters and things like that, a lot of what they're doing is, is providing surfaces to, to microorganisms. So that is, it is something we think about. It, we have one of the papers on the list that I shared um, in a very coarse way. We put oysters in tubes and we put shells in tubes. And, saw how different the responses were. Um, so it's, it is definitely something that we've looked at. Um, some collaborative work I did um, following this uh, was with uh, B.K. Song, who is at v Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences and his student. And we looked at not only the processes, but we looked at what organisms were present on shells in the oyster gut um, throughout the sediments. And it was, it was really, very interesting and as you could imagine, really dynamic and completely related, you know, nitrosomonas, nitrobacter, those are the, the suspects people talk about in trying to, to keep your, your aquaponic system going. And that coupling of oysters and plants is something that certainly goes on a lot in nature. And a brief anecdote, I thought I had invented an exciting new system to remove nutrients that would use a bivalve and a plant and I read about it more and more, and it turns out somebody thought of it in 1969 and published a paper about it. So it's not, it's, a lot of this stuff is not new. Some of the new measurements are, are adding to our, our understanding of the, the direct function in terms of specific processes, but you're absolutely right that surfaces are valuable wherever they are. Um, it would just be a cost benefit analysis. Uh, anytime you put something on, on the sediment in a estuarine system that makes people anxious. And so I think probably just putting a surface would not be terrifically well received, but I do think things that float like oyster culture um, may well play the same role. I don't know if you can hear me. Um, I can. Okay, great. So yes, 
I would second that because I used to be, uh, I used to run an aquaponics uh, for the Interfaith Food Shuttle. And then we had just one barrel which contained a lot of gravel and stuff like that. And nothing else was done to change the nitrogen cycle. And that took care of all the fish. We had uh, no aches or no problems and the, it was controlled. That's awesome. Microorganisms, everybody needs them. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi guys, Brian Snyder here. And just on the topic of uh, kind of coupling a bivalve with the plants, I'm sure that you guys are at least have heard of or not are familiar with like the integrated multi-tropic mm -hmm. aquaculture system. So they do that in a lot of other places where they grow kelp and other seaweeds directly next to fish net pens and shellfish aquaculture. So that is definitely a nice marriage that works together there. Yeah, no doubt. And that I think is a great point. And it's a technology that's been around for a while and that people are getting really good at. We tried, we ran an experiment where we grew oysters and ran the effluent across a sand bed and we were growing benthic microalgae that we then tried to resuspend and feed to the oysters. And it worked some, um, we grew a lot of benthic microalgae. We didn't do a super job of resuspending them to the point where it would be regarded as an efficient loop, but that's a really good point. And all of these, I mean, I've talked about one process, denitrification, but there are other transformation, transformations and releases of nitrogen directly from the oyster's metabolism that having plants around to take that up, um, if you can make that a beneficial thing, it's a great, a great marriage for sure. Well, and also having worked in oyster aquaculture, whether we want to or not, we unintentionally grow plants on every single piece of gear yeah. <laughs> that we put in the water. So. Yes, for sure. Are there other questions? Looks like hey, Mike. This is Valerie Wonderly. Hey, Valerie, how are you? Good, long time no see. No, great to see you. You too, great presentation. Um, Thank you. I just had a request about your literature list. Yep. Um, I don't see it in the chat. I maybe joined um, the chat later after you posted it. Could you repost that? Definitely, and I'll send it to you um, as a follow-up. Um, okay. Yeah, I think it's Thank at you. the very beginning, but I don't, I'm not 100%. I tried to paste the references into the chat and it wouldn't let me, so I had to put the, put the attachment, but we'll get it to okay. you for sure. Yeah, so when I, I'm not very, I'm new to Zoom, but when I scroll to the top of the chat, it st only starts at like 9.29 when I logged on. So I don't know. Perfect. If that has anything to I'll do put it back in in just a sec. Okay. Well, thanks. And congratulations on all your recent accomplishments. Thank you, Valerie. I hope Great you're well. See. You too. Take care. You too. Emily, do we have a winner? We do. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, so it looks Drum like roll. within our with our within our little time limit we had that first minute there. It looks like Sarah Yelton got the closest. If you can see. All right, her. Sarah. Get excited. <laughs> I am very excited. Oh yeah. <laughs> so what was the answer? The answer rounded is three hundred and twelve thousand. And 12,000 is remarkable, so. It we'll is remarkable. That. Yep. This was awesome. Thanks, Mike and Emily, for putting it all together. It was really great. Thank you all for coming. It was yeah. as fun as it can be all being on the video. That's right. And I, this is recorded, so this will be posted later today um, on our YouTube channel if you want to share it with anybody or rewatch it or... Um, yeah, we watched the whole thing. It was it was fantastic. Um, Regina, do you have a question? I see you're unmuted. Nope. I was just gonna say thank you. It was interesting for someone who's you know new to oysters. I've never had an oyster before, so <gasps> I may try one. I know. Shame on me. I oh, know. I feel an oyster rose coming at some point in time, maybe in oh, the fall. No, I don't know. 
Mike's first slide, they, they do not look appetizing, but you They're never know. Delicious. Oyster roast. <laughs> Late fall. I hereby declare it. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's a wrap. Thank you, everybody. And um, we'll, we'll see you next time. <laughs>